Hi everyone! Today I thought I would do the spring reading tag. This tag was created by Amy Jane Smith. You should definitely check out her channel. And I was tagged by Mercedes from Mercy's Bookish Musings, Olive from A Book Olive, and Elena from Tall Tales. So I figured it was high time that I actually got around to doing this since I'd been tagged by multiple people. Really love and enjoy all the channels I just mentioned, and they will all, of course, be linked down below if you're not subscribed already, which you should be. Question number one is, what books are you most excited to read over the next two months? I have a huge list of books that I'm really interested in right now, but I wanted to limit myself. I think when I did the either the fall or the, the winter one, I listed like 20 books and it was ridiculous, so I limited myself to just a couple. First, I really want to get back into reading short stories. I haven't read any short stories this month, and a couple collections that I'm most interested in that I have right now are The Paper Menagerie by Ken Liu and The Last Animal by Abby Jeanai. I also am basically just really excited about books that I recently acquired, so I have it in my head that I want to read David Mitchell's books in a semi-chronological order. I've already kind of failed at that because the first book I read of his was his second published novel, and then I read Cloud Atlas, which I think is his third published novel, so I've already sort of failed at that, but I figured I would backtrack and read his first published novel, which is Ghostwritten, and then from there try to read the rest of his works in chronological order from publication date. So I think I have it straight. So this is what I want to read next if I want to work my way backwards on that project. David Mitchell is an author that I definitely wanted to read more of this year. I made a whole video about that, so uh, I should get to this. Anyway, I don't really know what this is about. I think it takes place in Japan, which I have learned that David Mitchell can do well. At least he did it extremely well in Number Nine Dream, so hopefully this does not disappoint. And then also I really want to get to My Name is Leon by Kit DeWall, just because this was on a bunch of people's favorite books of 2016 list, and it really intrigued me, but it's really not an easy book to get hold of in the States, I don't think, so I had to get it from Book Depository, and I'm, and I'm eager to get to this one. And then lastly, I last month read Sweet Home by Karis Bray, so I immediately ordered A Song for Issy Bradley, which I want to get to really soon. I've just been really craving literary fiction lately, and I think that this will be perfect for what I'm looking for. Sweet Home is a collection of short stories, and one of the stories in that collection had something to do with the novel. I'm not really sure. There, were, there was a character named Issy Bradley in the short story, so I imagine that they're somehow related. Question number two, what book makes you most think of spring for whatever reason? I don't have a lot of books that make me immediately think of spring when I remember them. A lot of them make me think of winter. As I was sort of starting to pull things off the shelf to answer this question, I realized they were basically all just things that I read last spring, and they were probably only reminding me of spring because I read them last spring. So I decided instead to go on a similar route and pick up books that I really distinctly remember reading during spring. Um, one for each year the past three years. So one from 2016, one from 2015, and one from 2014. Books that I really enjoy, but I also really distinctly remember the feeling of reading them during springtime. So for 2016, the book that reminded me the most of my spring reading was Mr. Fox by Helen Oyemi. I really did enjoy this, despite the fact that I don't think I fully understood it, and I think it's a book that's worth rereading. It is a really strange fairy tale esque novel about an author who tends to kill off his female characters in really gruesome ways, and one day his muse physically manifests before him and demands that he starts treating his female characters better, and it kind of goes from there. Um, stories within stories, it's kind of hard to follow, and I think there was an expected background in fairy tale knowledge that I was kind of lacking, particularly with the tale of Bluebeard, so I don't think I entirely got it, but it was a really enjoyable ride, and I Definitely distinctly remember reading this last spring. The book that made me think of spring of 2015 was Bird Box by Josh Mallerman. I remember this really distinctly because I bought it in springtime in Chicago. And if I remember correctly, I read it really soon after returning home. I just remember this really distinctly because I can't remember very many other books where I actually did read it over the course of like a whole, you know, just one day. And often I don't really have the time for that, but it was a book that I made the time for and, and stayed up late to finish because it was that compelling. Um, and I also just remember really distinctly loving the dedication, and it was what really made me want to read the book. The dedication is, Sometimes I wish I were an architect so that I could dedicate a building to a person, a superstructure that broke the clouds and continued up into the abyss. And if bird box were made of bricks instead of letters, I'd host a ceremony, invite every shadowy memory I have, and cut the ribbon with an axe letting everyone see for the first time that building's name. It'd be called Debbie. Mom, Bird Box is for you. That like makes me tear up a little bit every time I read it. It's just the most incredible dedication, and it was a really, really fun reading experience. I loved reading this book, and it definitely reminds me of that particular point in my life. And then finally, a book that makes me think of the spring of 2014 is My Year of Meats by Ruth Ozeki. I fell in love with A Tale for the Time Being. It's the first Ozeki that I read, and I read that in 
I think fall of 2013. So I really wanted to get to more of Ozeki's works and uh, this is the second one that I read and I loved this book almost as much as I loved to tell for the time being. I also gave it five stars. I don't think there's anything really springy about this book or my experience with it. I just remember I was really in a Ruth Ozeki kick, but I also knew that she only had three novels, so I kind of tried to spread them out a little bit. And I just really remember connecting with the characters and loving the story. It is a dual narrative. One woman is Japanese and one woman is American, and the American is trying to make a documentary series about meat products in American homes for Japanese audiences. This is a book I do distinctly remember reading that spring. Question number three, the days are getting longer. What is the longest book you've read? So there's actually a really easy way to check this if you log all of your books on Goodreads, which I do. You can go to settings on any shelf that you want and you can sort things by page number. So that's what I did. And apparently, with the exception of the textbook that I read, which was the complete poetry and essential prose of John Milton, the longest book I have read is 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami, which I guess is no surprise because this is three books that comprise one book. It is extremely long. I think the third book is actually a little too long, but it's actually kind of incredible when you learn, which I did before I read this, that actually a significant part of this book was cut out, and I think that the Japanese version is even longer than this. Question number four, what books would you recommend to brighten someone's day? This is another tough one to answer because as I was looking through my shelves, I mean, I, I knew this already, but it was really difficult to find a book that, that was suitable for this answer because I read a lot of dark shit. I don't read things that are happy or or light or, or inspiring or any of those happy words. Like, I, a lot of the things that I read make me happy and I really connect with characters, but like, a lot of really awful things happen to those people. And I read a lot about really dark and twisted things. That's just what I gravitate to. It feels more real to me than things that are just perpetually light. Or, or really optimistic or happy. But anyway, I was able to come up with two things that I thought really suited this answer well. The first being The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. This is a book that just, when I think about it, I feel the warm, fuzzy feelings that this book made me feel. It's really just a, a book about found family and, and the journey that they take together. It's a really lovely, lovely book, and it definitely gives me the warm, fuzzy feelings when I remember the experience of reading this book. And I definitely think that this is a book that could brighten pretty much anyone's day. I also wanted to think of another thing for this answer, so I thought of An Age of License by Lucy Nisley. I imagine that any of Lucy Nisley's works would be a good answer for this question, but this is the only one of Lucy Nisley's works that I've read yet. This, I think, would brighten someone's day because it's really just about how listless your 20s are, which is a feeling that I can really empathize with right now. And when you're trying to find yourself and you're still just like trying to work out what being an adult means, and she does this through travel. And I love her voice. I, I find she's someone that I can really easily empathize with, but she's also really clever and funny, and she's also really open and honest about her experiences. And her drawings are just really cute. Some of them are black and white, and some of them are in color. She'll just, do, you know, draw things that she sees or She'll draw memories. There are cat drawings. I mean, how can you not like that? Um, yeah, so I'd say Lucy Nisley could definitely brighten someone's day. Number five, spring brings new life in nature. Think of a book that doesn't exist, but you wish it did. Example, if a book by a favorite author or a certain theme or issue. So I went with the author thing. And I'm holding out hope because these are both authors, as far as I'm aware, are still alive and could easily write more and they just haven't yet. So the first book that I really wish existed but that didn't is another collection of short stories by Julie Oringer. This is a beautiful collection and from what limited research I did online, this is the only collection she's ever published and she has released no other stories anywhere, not even in literary magazines or anything. Um, this is it, as far as I can tell. And that is such a shame because this book came out in 2003, so that was a while ago, and there just hasn't been anything else by her in 14 years. And that doesn't bode well. That says to me that she may not write anything else, and I really, really honestly hope she does because this is my favorite short story collection. I bring this book up in basically every video that I make, and I apologize, but it's because it's so good and I just think more people need to read it because it is the book that made me realize that short stories could be for me. I really connected to every single story in the collection. They're all about mostly young girls and confronting innocence versus that loss of innocence and growing up and coming of age and all that good stuff and it just really captures the feeling of being a child in a way that I haven't seen captured in any other book before. She does it so so well. Like Pilgrim is the first story in this collection. You should just read it because it's incredible. This will say I would love it if I found out that she was releasing another collection and I would buy it in a heartbeat. And another author that I really really want another book from 
I wish another one existed, was Ruth Ezeki, who I've already mentioned in this video, but A Tale for the Time Being, I would consider to be one of my favorite books of all time. I just absolutely loved this book. I've read it twice now, and I got different things out of it both times. I listened to it on audiobook the first time I, I, I read it, and then I read this physical copy later on. I've read just last year, I think. And she's a beautiful writer. I think she does really interesting things with juxtaposing Japanese culture and American culture, particularly from a Japanese-American perspective. The play with magical realism was really interesting, and her characters were just so empathetic. I loved Ruth Anne now in equal measure in this book, and I would love for her to write more things. There were ten years in between Ruthazeki's second novel and this one. So while I, I hope that Ruthazeki writes another book, I hope even more that it doesn't take another 10 years for us to get another book. If I have to wait until 2023 to get another Ruthazeki novel, I will, but I really don't want to. But I just really hope that she is writing other things and will come out with a new novel soon because she is great and I've read everything that she's written. Number six, spring is also a time of growth. How has your reading changed over the years? My reading has changed quite a lot. I was a big reader as a kid. Um, it was definitely one of the things that I identified the most with, like I identified myself as a reader. That really all started with Harry Potter, of course. And I struggled to find friends because people didn't really understand my passion for books. And my, my, my best friend in elementary school and I were friends because we shared a love for books and reading. And so I read a lot in elementary and middle school, but when I got to high school, I just really stopped reading. I was more consumed with other things. A lot of it was television, but a lot of it was just hanging out with friends and doing dumb stuff. So I really fell out of reading in high school and it wasn't until college when I really found my way as a reader again. That's not really that big a period of time, four years of high school, but it felt like a really big gulf in my reading life and now I realize like how much I could have gotten accomplished in those four years, how many books I could have read that I didn't. When I was in middle school I was reading a lot of like YA stuff. Twilight was really big when I was 13. Um, it, I was like the right age for it. The first Twilight book came out when I was 12 or 13, so I got really into that for a little while. I also really loved Neil Gaiman. American Gods is the first adult novel that I really remember distinctly ever reading. I was 14, I was in 8th grade, I remember reading American Gods, and there is um, some pretty graphic sex in that book, and drugs, and a man is eaten by a vagina in, if I recall, like the first 50 pages, or maybe even sooner than that. So it was definitely a, a lot different than the stuff I'd read before, but it was really eye-opening and really opened up the world of books and literature in a way that I hadn't experienced before, so I, I do have a really special place in my heart for American Gods for that reason, specifically. But yeah, between 14 and 18 I didn't read a whole lot, but when I got to college, I found books again because, first of all, I was an English major, so I had to read a lot for school. My, my freshman year in college was the year that I read The Perks of Being the Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky, and also the year that I read Looking for Alaska by John Green and The Fall in Our Stars by John Green. And I might feel differently if I read these books now, but they really meant a lot to me as an 18-year-old because I felt really lost in college. I'm not a person that makes friends easily. Not to get too real here, but I was really lonely in college and I struggled a lot and books were really comforting for me when I felt really alone and that's a really cliche thing to say but it's absolutely true. I spent a lot of my time alone reading because I just felt so anxious and so lost a lot of the time, especially living in the dorms my first year, that it was really hard. And you know things got a little bit better when I was able to live in an apartment after my freshman year, you know, have my own space and live with people that I wanted to live with and be around people that I wanted to be around. That year, in my first apartment on my own, was when I started this channel. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of people who've been doing booktube would say this, but booktube has really, really shifted my reading. Not only does it really accelerate the rate in which you read, I think that it really does just make you want to read more because you want to have stuff to talk about, but you also want to, you know, be reading new things that you find out about and you're constantly finding out about new books so you want to make time for those and then it's just a cycle. I think it just grows and grows. But also my reading has changed in just what kinds of things I like to read. Like I said, my freshman year in college I was reading, you know, some YA stuff. I connected with that a lot more but I soon kind of evolved out of that. It just it didn't resonate with me in the same way once I wasn't a teenager anymore. So I started exploring literary fiction and then really soon after that fabulous fiction and sci-fi and fantasy and I, I really have explored many genres that I was not interested in at all before and now I have really refined my reading taste and I think I really know and have a good understanding of what I look for in a book. And before booktube I wasn't really interested in short stories but that has totally changed and I also was not really interested in poetry before this year and that has changed as well so I think it just has really expanded the kinds of things I'm willing to try. It also has just really expanded my understanding of 
the diversity problem in publishing, which is true, and, and the, the importance in reading diverse voices, seeking them out, and promoting them on your channel. Um, if you have a voice to, to promote authors and, and voices that don't get recognized this often. It, the expansion of the kinds of books that I read, both in genre and form, but also you know, the kinds of people they're talking about, the kinds of authors that are writing these stories. The, the broader my, my taste becomes, the more I've found that I really enjoy what I read. And, and I've also loved books more passionately than ever. And so, you know, reading diversely is definitely a big change in my reading life, but has only made it all the better. I enjoy way more of the stuff that I'm finding now because these voices that I wouldn't have discovered otherwise are being promoted on this platform, which is awesome. Question number seven. We're a couple of months into the year. How is your reading going? It's been okay. So I'm doing this a little bit late. It's been, you know, three and a half months into the year and I'm doing pretty well. I'm reading more than I thought I could. I've read 31 books this year so far and I've really enjoyed a lot of them, but I've only had one five-star read this year so far. And it was the first book that I read in the year. So I finished it in early January and I haven't had a five-star read sense, which is a little bit disappointing, but I'm really hoping that the things that I have lined up for the near future will be five star reads because I am really excited about them and they're books that I am I'm really confident that I'm going to enjoy. So hopefully at the very least I'll like them a lot, if not absolutely love them. And the final question is any plans that you have that you're looking forward to over the next few months? And yes, I do. I'm actually going to London at the end of May and beginning of June. I'm really, really excited about it. I haven't been to London since I was 14 and I was only there for a couple of days. So I didn't really get to do a lot of things. We're going to be there for almost two weeks. We have an Airbnb set up. We're going to do all the touristy things, of course. Harry Potter studio tour. We're going to see a play at the Globe and we're going to go to the British Library and of course book shopping. All the book shopping will happen. I would really love to meet some booktubers while I'm over there. I know it might not happen, but I would love to go book shopping with some of you. I think that would be really, really fun. If that doesn't work out, then at least I'll do a lot of book shopping on my own and I'll probably buy way too many things and I'm really looking forward to it. That's like the big thing that's happening in springtime, but I cannot wait. It's a big thing that I'm looking forward to. That was the spring reading tag. I don't have anyone to tag, but I think that you should definitely do this tag if you want to because it is a really, really fun tag. These questions were awesome. Thank you, Amy. And yeah, other than that, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.